بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters today we're going to be speaking about Isa alayhi salam Jesus upon whom be peace man messenger Messiah now this presentation today has been taken from this brand new book called Jesus, Man, Messenger, Messiah, published by Aira, and it was written by Abu Zakaria, who is here today, and he's going to give us a 10-minute or 15-minute presentation after my discussion on the kind of unique highlights of this book. For those who will be watching online, you can go to iera.org, and you could basically give us your email and we will tell you how to get one of these books. In my view, and I spent a lot of time today reading the book and analyzing the book and studying the book. In my view, it's the best book on the topic of Jesus from an Islamic perspective, on the topic of deconstructing the Christian conception of Jesus in a warm, compassionate way. It's the best book on this topic in the English language. I haven't seen anything that's available and we have a very big library in the office and also other known speakers and students of knowledge have said the same thing. So I do encourage you to study because talks are 1%. We live in an age which we like to listen to things, we go on YouTube or Facebook and, we've, and we think that's enough. But we need to ground ourselves properly, looking at the references, studying the references, understanding the content, so you can change who we are. Because knowledge is not data, that's information. Knowledge is data that changes you. <laughs> it's information that has a transformative effect. And actually, by reading this book, I fell in love with Jesus. I did. I fell in love with Isa alayhi salam, the true conception of Isa alayhi salam, as you all know, Jesus, from an Islamic perspective, was a man, he was pious, he was very spiritual. If you read the many traditions you can find in Musnad Ahmed, you find some gems and some wisdom. And fundamentally, he was here to call people to the worship of the Creator and call them away from worshipping creation. And what does worship mean in Islam, brothers and sisters? It means to know God, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to obey Allah, to obey God, and to direct all your acts of worship to God, God alone. And this is very fundamental and the theme of worship is going to basically resonate throughout this presentation. Now as a starting note, I think it's very important for us to understand the context of today's discussion. The context is how we're going to gain some information, gain some knowledge rather, in order to compassionately and intelligently convey our understanding of Jesus to the world, including Christians. Christian is, Christians are non-Christians. And I really want you to understand, if we want to convey our conception of Jesus to the world, Christians and non-Christians, then we have to do it in a way that's in accordance with Islamic ethics and the Islamic values. What are the Islamic ethics and values when you want to call people to something, when you want to share something, when you, when you want to convey something? The Islamic ethics is that you genuinely care for human, human beings. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, and this hadith, this tradition can be found in Tariq al-Kabir, as narrated by al-Bukhari. He said, love for humanity, the Arabic here is not Akhihi, it's not brother, your brother, it's annas, linnas, love for linnas, what you love for yourself, okay? So it's very important if we love Islam, we love guidance, we love goodness, we love the truth, the correct conception of Jesus, if we love this, then we should share it naturally. For example, when you go to university, you have a professor there, he may be a professor on physics, the reason, or most of the time, the reason he's teaching physics, because he loves physics, right? 
The reason we want to share this understanding of Jesus is because we love Jesus, we love Allah, we love Tawheed, we love the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the oneness of God, and we want to share it with our fellow human beings. Okay? And that's very important. So that's the first point to understand. Love for humanity what you love for yourself. The other point you need to understand is don't be under any illusion that we Muslims have a monopoly of righteousness. We don't have a monopoly on righteousness. Just because we believe we have the correct conception of the divine, the correct conception of Jesus, it doesn't automatically mean that now we are outwardly more righteous than others. Allah makes this very clear. He tells us in the Quran that we shouldn't have wishful thinking. The people of the book, nor the Muslims, should have wishful thinking that we are going to go to paradise or we are the most righteous, okay? No one has a monopoly, you know, monopoly on righteousness. Allah makes this very clear in the third chapter of the Quran, verse 113, when Allah says, they are not the same. People, the people of the book are not the same. Everybody is different. Muslims are different. The people of the book are different. It's not one monolith group. And amongst the people of scripture are upright, just people that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is in the tafsir of At-Tabari. Don't think now there are like distinct camps. You have the Christians and the Muslims. The Muslims are brilliant and, and they're righteous. And you have the Christians, they're nasty. This is not a Quranic narrative, by the way. This otherization, this thinking there are distinct groups and the group that you don't belong to is all evil. This is not Islam. Allah makes this clear in the third chapter of the Quran. They are not the same. People are not the same. Muslims and the people of scripture. And this is very important for us to understand because it changes the way we approach other groups in society. That we don't think they're a monolith. They're all bad. No, there's bad amongst Muslims. There's bad amongst non-Muslims. And there you go. It's the human, it's the human predicament. Okay. Now, why am I mentioning this is because the concept of otherization, the concept of thinking that there is a distinct group and that group is all evil is actually for me the basis of extremism. It's the basis of hardening our hearts and we're not able to adopt the ethics of the Prophet wasallam when he went to all human beings and he had rahmah, he had compassion and he had hilm, he had forbearance. What is forbearance? Does anyone know? Forbearance is patience against hatred. Patience, steadfastness against people who attack you, okay? And what's the Quranic narrative on forbearance? Very famous verse in the context of conveying Islam. Allah says, respond to evil with that which is better. And between the people who had hatred amongst them, they will now become close, intimate, bosom friends. So this is the Islamic narrative. We love for humanity, what we love for ourselves. We don't think there's kind of binary groups and other groups other than our own are all evil. This is otherization and wrong and not Quranic. We're all human beings. And we want to share Islam in an intelligent and compassionate way. And also that we have to understand that no one has a monopoly on righteousness and that when we want to speak to people, we do it with forbearance and kindness and rahmah. That's very important for us to understand. So. Moving on, let's now focus on the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the concept of the creator, the concept of God in Islam. Now, essentially the concept of God in Islam is based on three main kind of categories, three main type of concepts. The first is the oneness of Allah's, of God's creative power. This is known in the Islamic tradition as the oneness of Allah's rububiyya. Okay, so Allah is the sole sustainer and maintainer, and owner, and carer, and nourisher of everything that exists, okay? No one shares this. This is solely, this solely belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is unique in this, and He is the sole sustainer, owner, maintainer, and nourisher of everything that exists. The second point is that Allah has names and attributes. He has defined Himself with names and attributes. We affirm these names and attributes. 
but we believe they're unique to him, okay? And we also believe he is transcendent. There is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his names and attributes are what you call perfection. In Islam, we believe in a maximally perfect theology, maximal perfection. What does this mean in the normal English language? It basically means that Allah's names and attributes have no deficiency and no flaw. Human beings' names and attributes are deficient and flawed. I may be caring, but my care is not boundless. And there is a flaw in the way I care. And I'm deficient, I can't care for everybody, right? But Allah, when He defines Himself as Al-Wudud, meaning the loving, coming from the Arabic wood, which means a loving that is giving, His love is boundless, has no deficiency, it's pure, right? And He has no flaw. This is what we mean by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We affirm His names and attributes, they are unique, He is transcendent, there is nothing like unto Him, and these names and attributes have no deficiency and no flaw. The other aspect of Allah's oneness, of who Allah is, is the oneness of His divinity. This is also known as the oneness, the Tawheed of Al-Ibadah or the Tawheed of Uluhiyyah, okay? The oneness of Allah's divinity. What does this really mean? It means that we direct all our acts of worship, acts could include the actions of the heart, right? And the actions of the limb. We we direct all our acts of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, not, to nothing else but to Allah. And as I said before, worshipping Allah means to love Allah, to know Allah, to obey Allah, to direct those acts of worship to Allah alone. And this is beautifully summarized in the 112th chapter of the Quran when Allah says, Qul hu wallahu ahad, say Allah, the deity who's worthy of worship, because Allah, according to the Arabic linguist, also means al ilah, the one who deserves worship. Okay, so say the one who deserves worship is one, Ahad. Ahad means not only one, but uniquely one. Okay, because Wahid means one as well, but it doesn't have the connotation of uniqueness. So Ahad is uniquely one. And then Allah says, God the eternal, he begets not, nor was he begotten. He wasn't born and doesn't give birth. And there is nothing like unto him. Okay, so this is the very unique understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's understood by five-year-olds. It's understood by 15-year-olds. It's understood by 55-year-olds. And if we reach the age of 500, it would be understood by 500-year-olds. Okay, because it's such an intuitive concept. Very intuitive. Like even when I was speaking to my father, he comes from a Christian background. When I spoke to him about these categories, this understanding of Allah. He says, yeah, of course, this is God. It's part of your fitrah. As you know, fitrah is the innate disposition, the nature Allah has created within you to acknowledge Him and to want to worship Him, right? So this is part of the fitrah. So this is the understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of God in the Islamic tradition. It's very pure. It's very innate. It's very intuitive. Now contrast this with the conception of God in mainstream Christianity. Okay? Now I want you to contrast this now, what I've just said about the oneness of Allah's rububiyyah, the fact that He is the sole creator, sustainer of the universe, His creative power, the oneness of His names and attributes, the oneness of His divinity. Contrast this innate natural belief with the conception of God in Christianity. Now, by the way, there are many differences. I'm not saying the whole of Christianity agrees with this. No, there are differences, but we're going to be talking about the most popular. The most popular conception of God in the Christian tradition is a conception of a triune God. A triune God. This is known as the Trinity, okay? So, this means that God is one being who exists eternally as three distinct persons. Let me just repeat. God is one being who exists eternally as three distinct persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And sometimes you will, you will hear it as the Holy Ghost. Now, the persons of the Trinity are not to be confused. So the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. All three persons of the Trinity are co-equal and co-eternal. Okay? Now I see many confused faces. Well, this is exactly what it creates. It creates this 
and natural confusion. And we're not saying this to belittle them. We're not saying this to, you know, mock. We're genuinely, genuinely having an intellectual exercise here, okay? Now, a key element in this trinity, in this triune God, is the concept of the incarnation, okay? What does this mean? It means that the second person of the trinity, the Son, took human flesh in the bodily form of Jesus. So there was this co-eternal, right? Co-equal Son, right? The second of the trinity, became human flesh in the form of Jesus. That's the concept of in incarnation. So when Maryam, when Mary, alayhi salam, gave birth to Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus, God, according to the Christian tradition, entered into creation. And at the virgin conception, God acquired an identity he would retain for the rest of eternity. So Jesus is said to be God-man. He has two natures, one divine and one human. So Jesus is said to be both fully God and both fully man. Okay? So let me just repeat this because it, it highlights one of the, a critical philosophical problem that undermines bi biblical Christianity, okay? Or mainstream Christianity. So let me just repeat this. There was the Son, the second of the Trinity, co-eternal, co-equal, enters into creation by human flesh in the form of Jesus. When he was so-called born as a result of Mary giving birth, he now acquired a new identity, God-man, fully God and fully human. Now, do you see what the problem here is? Because in biblical Christianity, they believe God is changeless. His essence doesn't change. The Trinity is part of his essence. But he changed. He got a new identity the moment he was born into earth, right? The moment he came into earth in the form of a human flesh, in the form of Jesus. He, God, apparently according to this Trinitarian understanding, adopted a new identity, God-man, fully God and fully man. So it means his nature changed. This is a philosophical problem because according to theology, according to Christian theology, according to biblical understanding, God can't change, but yet the essence of God changed because the Son, the second of the Trinity, was born into human flesh in the form of Jesus and adopted a new identity, God-man, fully God and fully human. That is a huge problem in Christianity and also it's a philosophical problem because if you think about it from an intellectual point of view, if the conception of God that his essence doesn't change, but then according to the, Trini the Trinitarian perspective, the second of the Trinity actually adopted a new nature, he changed, then it creates a huge problem. And it's no wonder Dr. James White, one of the foremost apologists for the Trinity today, he actually exposes the confusion that everybody has, well, Christians have. He says, for many Christians, the Trinity is an abstract principle, a confusing and difficult doctrine that they believe, although they are not really sure why in the honest moments. Now, obviously, you have many Christians when you go on the streets and you want to give da'wah, you want to convey a compassionate and intelligent case for Islam when you're on the internet or you're on the phone or you have family or you have your next door neighbors that you take care of, whatever the case may be, you have some rebuttals, some counter arguments, for example, and they come in the form of analogies to try and prove the Trinity from a rational point of view. <coughs> they say the Trinity is like an egg, the shell, the white and the yolk, but it's still one, right? Then they may say the Trinity is like three forms of water, ice, liquid and vapor. Or they say the Trinity is like a man who can exist as a father, he can exist as a son, and he can exist as a husband, right? <laughs> For many of the sisters, maybe he exists as a ghost. <laughs> so these analogies are very problematic from a philosophical point of view, from an intellectual point of view. We want to use our reason. Allah says to use your aql. Afala taqilun. Do they not use the intellect? So let's explain why the egg analogy is wrong. 
then an egg analogy doesn't work because the doctrine of the Trinity states that each person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is fully God. But you would never say the shell is fully egg, or the white is fully egg, or the yolk is fully egg. No one would ever say this, right? So it's a false analogy from that point of view. Also, take for instance the water analogy. It doesn't work either, because it implies that God first manifested himself as a father, then a son, and then a Holy Spirit. But this is wrong because this example, or this analogy of water, just shows that the forms are temporary. Ice doesn't always remain ice, right? Ice changes, then it becomes, becomes vapor, then it goes into the liquid. But according to mainstream Christianity, the Trinity is that they are co-eternal and co-equal. They eternally coexist. Water doesn't eternally coexist with regards of its ice and vapor at the same time. No, ice, it, it turns into ice because it freezes. Then when you heat it up a bit, it becomes liquid. Then when you heat it a bit more, boiling, it becomes vapor, right? That those states don't coexist, right? If I have a cup of water, you know, this cup of water now is liquid. You can't say it's vapor as well, right? You can't say it's ice now. No, it would change into ice depending on the conditions that we have. Finally, the man al analogy also fails to encompass the doctrine of the Trinity. Why? Because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit aren't functions. Because I'm a son, but I'm also a father, right? And I'm also a husband. These are functions of who I am, okay? These are functions. But the Trinity, when they say there is a Son, Father, and Holy Spirit, it's not just a function, it's a distinct person. There's not a person, Hamza, who's just the son, and a person, Hamza, who's just the father, and a person, Hamza, who's just the husband. No, these are functions of who I am. But according to the Trinity, the Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all distinct persons, not functions. It is no wonder the evangelical scholar Harold Linzel and seminary professor Charles Woodbridge wrote the following. They said, the mind of man cannot fully understand the mystery of Trinity. He who has tried to understand the mystery fully will lose his mind, but he, he would deny the Trinity would lose his soul. So it's almost saying to us that mainstream Christianity is saying, if you want to be saved and go to paradise and live a, a blissful eternal life, you have to believe in something the mind cannot fathom, cannot comprehend. I would even argue this is a form of injustice, right? Because God is just, He's fair, He's loving. He's not going to give you some ideas that are impossible to believe, right? He's not going to say to you, right, you know, if you go to paradise, you have to believe that one plus one is equal to five. That would be unjust by definition. Now, what's very interesting as well, brothers and sisters, is that the early church had lots of differences, as we say in the Islamic tradition, ikhtilaf, yeah? There was lots of differences. For example, the Ebionites, they believed Jesus was purely human. They didn't even believe he was divine. There was a difference in the early period of Christianity. The Ebionites believed that he wasn't divine, he was human. You also have the Marcionites. They believed that Jesus was purely divine and not human at all. So there was a big difference between the Ebionites and the Marcionites. Then you have, and I'm going to try and pronounce this properly, the subordinationists, the subordinationists, that's the one. So the subordinationists, they believe Jesus was both fully human and fully divine, but that he was created by God the Father, thus was not equal to the Father, but subordinate to him. A very famous, prolific Christian writer in history wrote over a thousand books. His name was Oregon of Alexandria. He was also a subordinationist, meaning that Jesus was both human and divine, but he's subordinate to the Father, okay? So he's not co-equal to the Father, he's subordinate to him. You don't have to understand this much. You could read the books for yourself, but the point is, we're just trying to show that in early Christianity, there was lots of differences. Now, what's very interesting as well is that the first three centuries of early Christianity had no fixed concept of Jesus either. They didn't have a fixed idea who Jesus was. Now, mainstream Christianity will basically tell you, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God and He's God, right? And He's part of the Trinity. 
But the first early, the period, the first three centuries of Christianity, they didn't have that fixed concept. There was lots of differences going on. For example, a lot of Trinitarians, a lot of Christians who believe in the Trinity, they like to quote early church fathers. And one of the early church fathers is called Tertullian, okay? And, you know, they say, oh, look, he believes in the Trinity too. But this is not the case. Because when we examine their writings, for example, if you examine the writings of Tertullian, we see that he was actually a bit confused. He didn't really believe, he didn't really believe in the Trinity as mainstream Christians believe in the Trinity. And this is an early church father. So look what he had to say. He said, for the father is the entire substance, but the son is a derivation and a portion of the whole. As he himself acknowledges, my father is greater than I. And that's why he basically says in the psalm, his inferiority is described as being a little lower than the angels. Thus the father is distinct from the son, being greater than the son. So an early church father, Tertullian, he basically said that the father is greater than the son. They're not co-equal, which is mainstream Christianity today. And what's interesting, the word Trinity doesn't even exist in the Bible. It doesn't exist. And, you know, it's very clear that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran, does mention that you shouldn't even mention three. Don't say thalatha, don't even say three. And Allah says, those people who say God is the third of three are defying the truth. There is only one God. And what's very interesting from a biblical point of view, Trinity doesn't really make sense, especially when you study the Bible. And I'm not a huge fan of studying the Bible in detail because from the Islamic and academic perspective, the Bible from my point of view, and I would even argue the intellectual tradition, even academia, Christians themselves too, professors, they would argue that the Bible doesn't have what you call textual integrity from a historical point of view. We can't truly say this is actually the Gospels. And I'm going to discuss this in a few minutes. But nevertheless, it's very interesting that Jesus actually preached Tawheed according to the Bible. There's an interesting incident in the New Testament. Now, it seems that Jesus is affirming the theology of the Jews, which was more closer to oneness, more closer to monotheism. And he said the following. The most important one asked Jesus, okay, because he was asked which of the commandments is the most important. And Jesus said, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love thy neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, and from then on no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is in Mark 12, 28 to 34. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't say, oh, by the way, Jewish man, what you mean by God is this triune God, the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't the whole point of revelation and the whole point of a messenger and a prophet like Jesus to clarify misunderstandings, to elucidate, right? To bring into light, to show clear guidance. Because the Jewish man here who was in this dialogue he had the assumption of the Jewish God, which was one, no trinity, purely one. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say Allah is uniquely one, right? Jesus obviously knew this. Now, if Jesus adopted the Trinitarian perspective of God, he would have said, ha, ah, you've misunderstood me here. What you mean by God is actually the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he didn't do this. So let's now talk about Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, man, messenger, messiah from a Quranic point of view. Now obviously the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands Muslims to love 
and to respect all the prophets and we don't make any distinctions between them. Allah says in the Quran in chapter 2 verse 136, So you believers say, We believe in Allah, in God, and in what was sent down to us and what was sent down to Abraham and Ismail and Is 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 Isaac and Jacob and the tribes and what was given to Moses, Jesus and all the prophets by their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and we devote, us we devote ourselves to him, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it's very interesting that the Quran mentions Jesus how many times? 25 times. Muhammad sallallahu I believe is mentioned only four times. Four or five times. Isa alayhi salam is mentioned 25 times. He has special names, epithets. Ruh Allah, the spirit of God. Kalam Allah, the word of God. Jesus is a very special place in the Islamic tradition. And there are some similarities, but lots of deviations too, which we're going to explain. So let's focus on the birth of Jesus. As you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, The angel said, Mary, God gives you news of a word from him, whose name will be the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, who be held in honor in this world and the next, who be one of those brought near to Allah, near to God. And Mary obviously reacts with surprise because she was chaste. She was a pious woman. And that's why it was going to be a miraculous birth. She said, my Lord, how can I have a son when no man had touched me? And the angel said, this is how Allah, this is how God creates what he will. When he has ordained something, he says, be, and it is. Be, and it is. And as you know, Isa alayhi salam as a child performed miracles in the cradle. Be full of wisdom and righteousness in the eyes of Allah, in the eyes of God. As Allah says in the third chapter, verses 46 to 48, he will speak to people in his infancy and in his adulthood. He would be one of the righteous. He will teach him the scripture and wisdom, the Torah and the gospel. Now when Mary alayhi salam became pregnant, she withdrew. And she withdrew herself from the people. She knew that they wouldn't believe her. And because she was pious, she couldn't deal with the shame. She didn't know what to do. Because people would slander her and accuse her of having committed fornication. And Allah says in chapter 19, and so it was ordained. She conceived him. She withdrew to a distant place. And when she was in labor, she was in so much pain and utter despair. Then Allah, through his mercy, gave her sustenance. As Allah says in the same chapter, And when the pains of childbirth drove her to cling to the trunk of a palm tree, she exclaimed, I wish I had been dead and forgotten long before all of this. But a voice cried to her from below, do not worry, your Lord has provided a stream at your feet. If you shake the trunk of the palm tree towards you, it will deliver fresh, ripe dates for you. This reminds me of my wife, uh, you know, delivered uh, my first son. And we had a lot of ajwa dates, because these were the, apparently the dates of, 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 of Mary, alayhi salam. And, you know, she was going forward with this pain and trauma. It was like a 40 hour labor. And she's so strong, she didn't eat the dates. I ate all the dates. I was so worried, you know. It just reminds me. I remember we had a whole box. I ate every single one and she didn't have anything, yeah. SubhanAllah, may Allah bless our sisters because birth, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater. You take your hat off to women after birth. That's all I'm saying, yeah. You know, that's why I really believe that, I know sometimes I don't show it, but I really believe that women have a higher status in Islam than men because they're the, they are the first teachers of the scholars and they're the first protectors of the people that protect us right so what higher status you know there's no other higher status you know from that point of view so let's continue so she took the dates she had sustenance from her lord and then god informed her allah informed her that when she returns to her people she would not speak a word to them she's not allowed to speak a word to them so allah said so eat, drink, be glad, and say to anyone, you may see, I have vowed to the Lord of mercy to abstain from conversation. I would not talk to anybody today. So after giving birth to Jesus, many, Mary returned to her people and they confirmed her fears by implying that she committed fornication. They were like saying, Mary, look what you've done. 
you know, what's happened? You've had a baby. You must have committed fornication. So what does she do? She basically points to the child. She went back, and this is what Allah is saying in chapter 19. She went back to her people, carrying the child. And they said, Mary, you have done an evil, terrible thing. Sister of Aaron, your father was not an evil man. Your mother was not unchaste. So she pointed at him, at the child, Isa alayhi salam. They said, how can we converse with an infant? He can't talk. And this was one of the miracles of Isa alayhi salam. And Isa alayhi salam said the following beautiful words. Indeed, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me scripture and made me a prophet. And he has blessed me wherever I am and has commanded me to pray, to give alms as long as I live, to cherish my mother. He did not make me domineering or graceless. Peace was on me the day I was born and will be on me the day I die and the day I am raised to life again. SubhanAllah. And we know Isa alayhi salam did many, many miracles. In chapter 3 of the Quran, Isa alayhi salam said, I will heal the blind and the leper and bring the dead back to life with God's permission. So this was the reality of Isa alayhi salam. Now, Interestingly, the nature of Isa alayhi salam was one of a man that had a message and that message wasn't unique to him. It was part of the prophetic mission that every single prophet came here to teach us about Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. The fact that we must direct all our acts of worship to Allah alone. That the thing we must know the most is Allah. The thing that we must love the most is Allah. The thing that we want to obey the most is Allah and the thing that we direct all our acts of worship to the most is Allah or the only acts of worship that, that we manifest is to Allah alone. This is the essence of Tawheed and this is what all the prophets came to teach us about which frees us from the darkness and the slavery of worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala other than your creator and maker. Now, I want to move now on the crucifixion. Now the reason I want to do that, because now we've understood the contrast between the two different conceptions of God, the Christian conception, the Islamic conception, the understanding of Jesus. So we're understanding what is the most spiritual, what is the most rational. Truly it's the Islamic conception. But I want to move now on the crucifixion. Because the crucifixion gets some kind of justification from mainstream Christianity and Christian scholars Based on, based on the idea of the, th the theology of giving blood, right? Because a lot of Christian scholars go to the Old Testament and they say, look, man, human beings, right? They have inherent sin because Adam alayhi salam, okay? And his wife, you know, they sinned. And we have to carry the burden of their sins. So man is inherently not good. But inherently he's born into sin. And the only way, because God is so holy, the only way to cleanse yourself from this sin is with blood. Right? Now contrast this with the Islamic point of view. The Islamic tradition says that everyone's born in goodness. The idea of fitrah. Whoever they are, if they're born in China, if they're born in Australasia, even if they were born on the moon, they have a fitrah, an innate disposition. And that disposition is goodness. It's based on goodness, not on evil. So a birth of a child from a theological point of view, according to Islam, is good news. It's something positive. But a birth of a child from a Christian point of view, what I mean by Christian is the theological point of view, is that he's born into sin. And this is why they refer to different aspects of the Bible. For example, in Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin, for the, to pay sin, right, to remove sin, is death. Also in Hebrews 9.22, it says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Again, in Romans 5.12, it says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Now, the solution according to the New Testament is as follows, that Jesus died on the cross to undo 
Adam's original sin and therefore everybody's sin. As you see in Romans 5.17, it says, For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more would those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. But there's something very important here that we need to understand. You remember what we said about Allah's names and attributes in the beginning? What are they? We have a maximally perfect theology. There are not, there, there's no deficiency and no flaw. The concept of blood atonement, the concept of requiring blood, okay, in order to gain forgiveness. This concept itself is number one against the mercy and forgiveness of Allah. The fact that he's Ar-Rahman. That's, that's what they're trying to say. If they claim that in order for us to be forgiven, right? Because we're carrying the burden of not our own sins, but also the sins of Adam. The only way to be cleansed of that sin is through blood. This is in a direct contradiction to the concept of mercy from a maximally perfect theological point of view. The fact that God is supposed to have perfect names and attributes with no deficiency on floor. Why would he want blood? Right? Further, this goes against his names and attributes of him being the just. Because is it fair that me and you are carrying the sins of somebody else? Is that fairness? Is that fairness by, by the very definition of what it means to be just and fair? So the concept of blood atonement in Christian theology is number one, unjust. And number two, is antithetical to mercy. So let's just repeat this. So in mainstream Christianity, they basically say, Adam sinned, we're carrying his sin. That's unjust. Because why are you carrying the sin of somebody else? In order to cleanse yourself from your sins and carrying somebody else's sins, you need blood. So that is unjust and not very merciful. Allah says in the Quran, no soul laden bears the load of another. Chapter 35 verse 18. If you look at the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, he says that no human being is going to carry the burden of someone else's sin, someone else's mistakes. This is unjust. And we know this as parents. You know when kids sometimes are learning to walk and they bump into the chair? What do you do? You go, naughty chair, don't we, right? You don't go to the kitchen and go into the fridge and say, naughty fridge, right? It, just, it doesn't work. The, it doesn't make sense in the, in the concept of justice, right? Imagine going to a court of law. And the judge says, Hamza, you're in prison for 30 years. Why? I haven't done anything. I know. But some guy down your road, he killed three people. So you're in prison for 30 years. But I didn't do it. Right? I'm carrying the burden of someone else. That's inherently unjust. Forget from a spiritual point of view, from a philosophical point of view, it's unjust by the very definition. So for us to get the blame of someone else's sin is unjust. And Allah is not unjust. So just by the very concept of who God is, we reject this blood atonement. And we reject the carrying sin of, of somebody else. Also, if one says that you have to basically have blood, right? In order to basically remove our sins. This is not very merciful, right? You're saying God is the most merciful? God is forgiving and loving, even according to Christianity, but yet he wants blood? And what he did, he sacrificed his son, who's supposed to be God, sacrificed himself in some kind of paradoxical way, and, and tortured himself, which is, sounds quite weird, right? Does that make sense? What does Allah say? And, you know, and sometimes other traditions think that they have a monopoly on spirituality. How's your relationship with God? It's very good, thank you very much. I don't need blood, right? What does Allah say in the Quran? Say, if you love God, then follow me, referring to Muhammad. Follow Muhammad Sallallahu and Allah will love you and forgive your sins. Because the Prophet Sallallahu is a rahmah, is a mercy to the worlds. All we have to do as Muslims is stand and pray and just raise your hands and say, Ya Rabb, forgive me. And be sincere, Allah will forgive you even if you've murdered people. That's the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our Rabb, this is our Lord. Our Lord is not a Lord of blood. Our Lord is a Lord of love. A Lord of Rahmah, excessive Rahmah. Al-Wudud means excessively loving, that special love that He has. 
and His Rahmah, His loving mercy encompasses all things. All you have to do is turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You've been drinking all your life. You've been hitting all your life. You've been stealing all your life. The minute you do tawbah, you do repentance and say, I'm, I'm, I feel bad, I feel remorse, but I know your mercy is greater than my mistakes. And you ask for Allah for forgiveness, Allah forgives you. This is mercy. This is forgiveness. Not wanting to sacrifice and torture somebody else. In the case of biblical Christianity, torturing God himself. This is antithetical to mercy and forgiveness. Now, I want to raise something that's not actually raised in the book. Which is a bit interesting. You know, in the Bible it says that God loved human beings, that he sacrificed his own son, right? To basically free us from sin. And once I asked a Christian... Well, that's very interesting. Isn't me being a Muslim also sinful? Yeah. But didn't God sacrifice his son for my sin as well of being a Muslim? So I don't have to be a Christian. <laughs> he said, oh, but you have to accept the gift of the sacrifice. Well, that's very interesting because there's no intrinsic value of the sacrifice then. What is valuable is me just accepting it, which changes the whole theological paradigm. Do you see? That's something interesting to think about. So... Last few points. So we spoke about, we've alluded to the crucifixion in terms of blood atone, atonement. But let's now really think about, is the crucifixion an indisputable fact? This is very important for us to understand. Now, from a historical point of view, the only kind of narratives we have are the eyewitness testimonies of the Gospels. Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Now, this is not divine revelation. This is not something that is 100% in terms of, it's not 100%, it's, what kind of word shall I use? It doesn't convince the mind, right? It's just based on eyewitness testimony. But in order for an eyewitness testimony to be valid, especially in the context of writing things down, you have to have at least three things. Know who they are, their identities. Know the content of their writings and the date of their writings. But I'm telling you, when you study the Gospels, you don't know their full identities. I believe we don't even have their second names. We don't even know the contents of their writings, which I'm going to discuss in a little while. We don't even know the date of their writings. Some of the most earliest manuscripts are like around 200 or 150 years after the so-called crucifixion of Jesus. So we don't have the dates, we don't even have the identities, we don't have the external biographies of these people that are even robust enough for us to really say, yes, these people were these people, right? So from a rational point of view, you could never accept these testimonies. And not for testimonies so great, like someone being crucified who's supposed to be the son of God, right? <laughs> we don't have the identities, the content of the, the, content of the writings, or even the date of the writings. So let's focus now just on the content of the writings. And one would argue, well, we have the Gospels, bro. Hamza, we have the Gospels. You know, the writings are there. Yeah, but are we sure that that is what they wrote? Because if you study the history of the Bible, there's a lot of confusion from an academic point of view. A few points for me to, for me to plant in your heart and mind. You'll have to research this yourself further because of time. The first point is this, that the different churches of Christianity disagree what the Bible is. The Greek church, the Syriac church, the Catholic church, the Protestant church, the Coptic church, the Anglican church, they don't have an agreement on what the Bible is. For example, the Protestants have six less books, I believe, and the Catholics have six extra books, or whatever the case may be. There is this kind of differing amongst them. Also, the church fathers never saw the Gospels as authoritative. These include Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, Papias of Hierapolis. Now, a noted authority in New Testament criticism, Brut Metzger, who's also a Christian, he comments on Clement of Rome, one of the church fathers. He said, he knows several of the Paul's epistles and values them highly for their content. The same can be said of the epistle of Hebrews, of the Hebrews, which he is well acquainted, 
although these writings obviously possess for Clement considerable significance, he never refers to them as authoritative scripture. Brutz Metzger, Professor Brutz Metzger also says, when he's commenting on Ignatius, another church father, he certainly knew a collection of Paul's epistles, including 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Romans, Galatians, F F uh, Philippians, I'm probably pronouncing this really wrong because I'm doing it in a Greek way, yeah? Colossians and Thessalonians, right? It is probable that he knew the Gospels according to Matthew and John and perhaps also Luke. There is no evidence that he regarded any of these Gospels or epistles as scripture. Fundamentally, and Brutz Metzger, Professor Brutz Metzger makes a beautiful point. He says the criterion for canonicity, meaning the criterion for saying these books are the Bible, was what? There's only one main criteria. Who could guess what it was? The main criteria for what was going to become the Bible was that these books had to agree with the current, at that time, church teachings. Do you see the big circular argument there? Isn't the whole point of canonizing a book to give you the teachings for the church? But what the church did is that their criteria was that these books are going to be the Bible, our guidance, if they already agree with us. <laughs> and that's a huge problem. So, what's very interesting, the Catholic Encyclopedia also says there is no clear-cut canon anyway. It says the idea of a complete and clear-cut canon of the New Testament existing from the beginning, that is from the apostolic times, has no foundation in history. The canon of the New Testament, like that of the old, is the result of a development of a process at once stimulated by disputes with doubters, both within and without the church, and regarded by certain and retarded by certain obscurities and natural hesitations, and which did not reach its final term until the dogmatic definition of the Tridentine Council. Also, you have many scribal errors. If you look and search for yourself the kind of facsimiles or the pictures of the scribal errors of the development of the Bible, because you had to copy the Bible, right? There was no printing press. There are some margins in the footnotes the scribes are debating each other and one scribe says you fool <laughs> leave the original reading i know it sounds really funny but you have it. it it's there also there are many parts omitted that are now not considered even part of the bible consider for example mark 16 19 to 20 it's not considered a later edition it was added it wasn't part of the original so from this point of view how can you even start to believe in the crucifixion because the only evidence we have from a historical perspective, real historical evidence is the Bible. But does the Bible satisfy intellectually the mind concerning believing it as reports of eyewitness testimonies? I don't think so. I, 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 I don't think so at all. So what's very interesting as well is that even many early groups of Christianity in the first and second centuries, they even denied the crucifixion of Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? For example, you had the Baz Basidilians, right? There was a first century scholar called uh, Basidiles, right? I probably pronounced that really wrong as well. And his followers, who are called the Basidilians, they believed that Jesus was saved from the crucifixion and another person, Simon of Cyrene, was crucified in his place, which is what you may argue some scholars interpret the verse of the Qur'an when it was made to appear it was like Jesus, right? Some, like Ibn Abbas, radiallahu an, and many other ulama, they say there was a replacement, okay? So that's an interesting view. Also, you have the Philadelphians. They basically also seem to have rejected the crucifixion because Ignatius, one of the church fathers, writes a letter to them to basically tell them to come back to what he considered orthodoxy, right? You also had the Trallians. Again, they seem to have believed that the death of Jesus was only in appearance. And Ignatius again writes them another letter. So in the early period, there was a lot of differencing differences from that point of view. But I want to make a very important point. The reason we believe that Jesus wasn't crucified, it was made to appear that way, okay? And Jesus is alive is because the Quran says so. 
That's valid evidence for a Muslim. Why? Because we have evidence why the Quran is from Allah. Another book written by a beloved Abu Zakaria is called The Eternal Challenge. A journey through the miraculous Quran. If you go to onereason.org, you could put in your email and download it for free. We even have prints available. The second edition is out now. And that book articulates good reasons why the Quran is from Allah. It's preserved. It has miraculous fe features concerning its structure, its linguistic miracle, its information, etc, etc. So since we could show the Quran is from Allah, then what it says about Jesus is going to be true anyway. So, what's the summary? The summary is, brother, brothers and sisters, that Isa alayhi salam was ascetic, he was pious, he was a man of Allah, a man of God. He wasn't God. And he called people to the worship of God, to the worship of the Creator, not to the worship of creation. And the Quran makes this apparent in chapter 19, verse 30 to 35. Jesus said, I am the servant of Allah, of God. He has granted me the scripture, made me a prophet, made me blessed wherever I may be. He commanded me to pray, to give charity as long as I live, to cherish my mother. He did not make me domineering or graceless. Peace was me in the day I was born and will be on the day I die and the day I'm raised to life again. Such was Jesus, son of Mary. This is a statement of truth about which there are in doubt. It would not befit God to have a son. He's far above that. When he decrees something, he says only be and it is. And Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, his main point was Tawheed, the oneness of God, the oneness of the Creator, the oneness of the Creator's divinity. As the Quran says in 43.64, that Jesus said, Indeed, God, Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship Him, that is a straight path. Brothers and sisters, just to completely end, I really want you to understand that most Christians don't even know this, okay? I want you to introduce the book to you that has far more beautiful content and lots of references. I want you to give you the idea that we have a very strong intellectual tradition concerning the conception of Jesus that's spiritual, intuitive, natural, profound, and in line with the basic understanding of the Creator. And I want you to understand that most Christians they're deep spiritual human beings, okay? I had an interfaith, I think a few years ago in Leicester, and I had a very loving time. I felt a lot of love, okay? And this is how we should be to our brothers and sisters in humanity as well. And the reason they believe in Jesus in this way, because that's all they know. That's all they know. And they believe they have a relationship, and they feel this natural fitri, you know, the innate disposition, connection with something and they, they want to manifest the instinct of worship and all they have is this the kind of mainstream christian understanding of jesus what we need to do is show them they could keep this love for jesus they could keep the love ahlan wa sahlan come welcome that love you must have but now understand jesus for who he really was and understand god in the way that God wants to be understood concerning his uniqueness and oneness. You don't even have to go for all the stuff I did today, okay? It's just, just in case you have one of the Christian missionaries on your doorstep, yeah? <laughs> and it's a really fascinating book, but generally speaking for the awam, for the masses, just be a loving human being, respect them, even if they say, oh, I had a dream of Jesus, and it's so spiritual, and that's why, don't negate them. You know when you negate someone's spiritual experience is equivalent of negating them. Say, I agree, you may have had an experience, but let me show you how you could interpret that experience. Do you see? Give them the reference point. Show them that the real way of looking at their experiences in their life is through the lenses of oneness. Tawheed. So what I would advise to the brothers and sisters is that when you talk to Christians, be loving as you should be, be caring as you should be, be fair as you should be, have akhlaq and adab, have forbearance. If you get harmed, don't respond with evil, respond with goodness, right? That's a key attribute of the prophets. Very famous story of the Jewish man who came to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ owed him some money. Jewish man dragged him by the neck, left a mark. One of the Sahaba, one of the companions wanted to saw him out. The Prophet stopped him 
And what did he say? You know, we expected something better from you. That you teach him to ask for his money nicely and you teach me to give on time. Forbearance, even though he was attacked. And this Jewish man became a Muslim. Why? Because he wanted that sign. He, there was one remaining sign that he didn't see in the Prophet wasallam, And that sign was a sign of forbearance. As Allah says, respond to evil with that which is good. Let me end with a funny story. There was a brother who adopted the sunnah, the prophetic way of tolerance. Tolerating anyone's belief, atheist, Christian, whoever we are, respect, right? Being fair, all of these values that everyone agrees with, generally speaking. You know, give people the, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't there's no compulsion in religion, give people their liberties. Now, he was having a stall outside Stratf outside Stratford shopping center. Man of Sunnah, you know? He, not Sunnah the clothes, Sunnah here. Which, which counts the most, right? And some lady came up to him and spat on his face. He responded to evil with that which is better. What did he do? He kept on smiling as if nothing happened. Smiling at her, picked up some tissue, wiped, her, wiped his face. Then he got another tissue and gave it to her. Because she had some of her dribble on her face. And she took it and she walked off. After a few weeks or months, she came back to the same stall. She became a Muslim. Respond to evil that which is better. And the enmity between two people, it's as if they now would become like bosom intimate friends. And you know what happened after a few more months or years? They got married. <laughs> so sisters, the advice here is if you want a good husband, spit on him first. <laughs>